I'm Jamie Druckmann. I'm the Associate Director at, at IPR, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today for our second Monday COVID seminar. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dan Rodriguez. Um, I've known of Dan since I was in graduate school in, in the 1990s, when I, I think we overlapped in San Diego, although he was at um, a different institution. He was working with my advisor, so I've known of him and admired him for a very long time. And it's um, he's currently the Harold Washington Professor of Law at Northwestern. As everybody knows, he also was the illustrious Dean of the Law School from 2012 to 2018. And he's very kindly agreed to present today on COVID-19 and public policy response by government key emerging legal issues. So thank you very much, Dan, and thank you again for everybody for joining us. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks, uh, Patricia and Diane, all, all who uh, were willing to have me uh, uh, give this presentation. Happy, happy to, uh, to to do it. Let me let me immediately answer uh, uh, a question that I'd pull it put into the category of hubris. What what? Why would anyone think they have some general ambient expertise in all uh, or most legal issues in connection with COVID nineteen? I'll put that to rest. I don't. No one does. It's uh, a bit of uh, the law of the horse as it were, since uh, given how uh, many myriad issues there are. I became interested in uh, this subject a few weeks ago in, in earnest uh, when, uh, when I, in a moment of weakness, volunteered to teach a, a voluntary uh, pop-up course at the law school, which I'm in the last week of, uh, that covers a variety of issues in connection with the coronavirus. Uh, that has morphed into a MOOC, which is uh, launching uh, next Monday. Uh, to the world on uh, on various uh, of these issues, so I'm delighted to ha have a chance to at least uh, tackle a few of them in connection with uh, in connection with this uh, this topic. So so uh, uh, let me get started uh, right now. Uh, uh, general some general issues. Uh, coronavirus crisis. I won't belabor this point. It sort of uh, summarizes uh, what what you know to be the case and what what folks have been talking about and writing about on a, on a daily, on an hourly basis, emergence of the crisis. And this is, this is a sort of a, a truncated timeline, right? There began with uh, federal advisories, immigration bans, which you hear about every day from the White House podium, right? The ban on immigration from uh, China and then from Europe. That's a key part of the federal role. There is, uh, to summarize, a, a vast subject, uh, public health mobilization that happens at the federal level the state level, the local level. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about it, but the federal government declares uh, a, an emergency. President exercises his authority under the Public Health Service Act and the Stafford Act. Uh, and the federal government and state governments provide a variety of forms of guidance. It seems like a lifetime ago, but I'm talking about in February and even in early March, uh, suggestions about social distancing, limitations on gatherings, maybe it's first 100, then it's 50. Uh, you can't overestimate, actually, the significance of the decision of the National Basketball Association, the NBA, in the earlier part of March to basically cancel its season as an impetus. And then finally, and this will be the focus, uh, focal point, uh, a variety of gathering limits, social distancing restrictions, shelters in place, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the like. When I talk about travel restrictions here, by the way, I'm not talking so much about the immigration bans as the variety of restrictions that are imposed by some states on travel to their states. We'll talk a little bit about some of the some of the legal consequences, and then a variety of second order restrictions, which are, uh, to put it mildly, uh, works in progress. So uh, again, in the interest of time, sort of the the legal issues is, is I would rather than rather than think about them as subject matter by subject matter, which is certainly one way to understand them, I would sort of frame them as as this: uh, the power of the state government to restrict individual and business behavior, which will really be the sort of the lion's share of of, of my comments here. Uh, uh, the presidential authority to aid state and local health efforts. And, and I, I use the term aid advisedly. So it's not so much the commandeering or the conscription. So just as a spoiler alert, for example, the federal government lacks the power to impose a nationwide lockdown. And simultaneously, the federal government lacks the constitutional power to, uh, re uh, to release the state's uh, from or release individuals and businesses from their lockdown. But nonetheless, the president has authority to aid state and local health efforts uh, that are ubiquitous. Presidential authority to direct and restrict uh, state functioning. And then in the interest of time, won't have a lot of time for it, but I wanna talk a bit about outside of the, 
the kind of the public law issues, the relationship between individuals and the government and levels of government, some uh, really interesting novel issues that arise in connection with private liability and obligation, and then also criminal, uh, criminal justice. This is a very incomplete timeline and a rather sloppy slide to be sure, but uh, just to give you a sense, again, it seems like ancient history. We're talking about activities that have happened really in the last two months and uh, in earnest in the last six weeks. So the NBA shuts down uh, on March 11th, the day after the NCAA cancels its, uh, the rest of its sports, and a few days later, the NCAA tournament. There are uh, a variety of workplace uh, restrictions and regulations, uh, it, more at the level of guidance. Here, talking about the, the gathering, the, the size of various gatherings, not only talking about big events like Broadway or, or concerts or uh, sports gatherings, but uh, the amount of people that gather or congregate in a restaurant or a bar. Dan, uh, just a very quick question. Um, sure. We can't seem to be able to see your slides. Oh, okay. Let me, uh, oops. Sorry about that. That's let me, okay. Uh, let me go back. I should have done this at the beginning. I actually know how to do this believe it or not, and that is to share my screen, <laughs> share the slides. So I apologize, you haven't missed anything really important, but uh, uh, nonetheless, let's see. Sorry about that. Can you see them now? Yes. Okay, all right. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me start there. This, these are basically framing, the, framing the, the, uh, uh, the legal issues. So let me get to the timeline. Sorry about that. Uh, sports shutdown, workplace restrictions and advice uh, given, various bans on size of gatherings. And then, of course, all uh, hell breaks loose. I mean that in both the positive and the negative sense of the term uh, when states issue a variety of sheltering orders. Fun fact. The very first sheltering order is actually issued in Puerto Rico on the 15th of, of, uh, of March. The next day, six Northern California counties and the city of Berkeley impose uh, shelter in place orders, which, which I'm using here to describe not only uh, command and control restrictions on individual behavior, but also uh, bans on congregating in bars and restaurants. In essence, shutting down bars and, and restaurants and other uh, retail establishments uh, subject or save for various essential activities, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, California and Illinois, as you know, uh, began just a few days later with the first statewide shelters in place, and then the next day, New York, and this is just up till present, all but seven uh, states. Just as a footnote, uh, so there are the seven rogue states, as it were, but even within those states, most, uh, for the most part, so for example, Utah doesn't have a shelter in place, but Salt Lake County does. Uh, Wyoming doesn't have a shelter in place order, but Jackson County does. So it's actually even fewer than meets the eye in terms of the population in the United States that is not, as we, as we talk here on the 20th of April, subject to uh, shelter in place uh, restrictions and, uh, and regulation. Uh, uh, painting with a very broad brush, the structure of the state sheltering edicts. You cannot leave home and accept in limited circumstances. I hasten to add those circumstances are defined state by state. There's no national, there's national guidance and advice. You hear about that from the White House podium, but the definition of what the circumstances are in which individuals can leave their home are defined by reference to the executive orders that exist state by state. By and large, all of the states provide the opportunity or the or the the, uh, the the discretion of individuals to travel to work where their place of work is open, to buy important goods. Uh, those two are defined somewhat differently by state law. They they all include gro grocery stores. Most of them include liquor stores and whatever they sell in liquor stores. Illinois and California includes uh, marijuana dispensaries, even for recreational use. Uh, the states have different regulation shelter. Again, you all know this, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. States have different rules and regulations with regard to recreation. From where I sit right now, I'm looking out through my window in Northern California, and all of the parks and all of the beaches are shut down. In some states, they, uh, they are also shut down. In some other states, they have been shut down. But as of this morning in the state of Texas, for example, they've opened up 
back up on a limited basis. And there are gray areas. And when I say gray areas, I don't mean just there are some legal disputes around this. The definition of the executive orders often do not settle the question of whether and to what extent there are restrictions on individuals' ability to travel to other regions or to other states. I should put the point another way. There are not, to the best of my knowledge, any executive orders that, that specifically limit the ability of individuals to travel from region to region or from state to state. The airports have not been closed down. Flights, while to a trickle, are nonetheless take off and land. So there are, there are uh, at present, no restrictions on the ability in, of individuals to move from place to place. There are restrictions uh, uh, on congregation in groups of certain sizes. Uh, religious gatherings have gotten a lot of the ink, but these uh, li limitations on congregation also implies, uh, imply in the, uh, in, in the work, uh, in, in the work uh, setting. By the way, as, as an aside, this is, this is a fast moving train, right? As recently as the last 48 hours, there is a groundswell of interest in restricting congregation, even in grocery stores. So you know about the social distancing restrictions that have been imposed in a variety of, of, uh, of grocery store settings. You probably also know of the, of the limitation on, on, on hours. You may not know that there are some efforts underway in various hotspots to close down grocery stores altogether. Let me put it a different way to close down individuals going into grocery stores and shifting it as they have to restaurants entirely for takeout and for delivery. So we might actually see in the next few days the, the shutdown of your ability, uh, whether it's in Illinois, Chicago, to walk into a, a Whole Foods. Uh, again, uh, these uh, sheltering and business restrictions uh, prohibit uh, businesses to operate except those that provide essential services. Those essential services once again, are defined differently by st uh, state to state. I talked about the open areas. The only one uh, uh, I want to mention in this last bullet point, when I talk about state quarantine regulations, I'm talking about the restrictions that exist in a growing number of states on individuals who come from out of state, certain states, particularly New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and other hotspots, and require those individuals to quarantine, to self-quarantine for, uh, for a period of time, usually uh, 14 days. Those have been principally uh, focused on the Northeast. Some states like Rhode Island have been especially aggressive, not only about their restrictions, but about policing those restrictions. But those are, those again are an area that's evolved. It really began with Florida, the governor of Florida, imposing the quarantine regulations on folks traveling in from New York. Uh, uh, you, you'll, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to go through the 50 shelter orders. I just want to mention California, Governor Newsom's order, which is fairly typical. I'll skip again in the interest of time, Governor Pritzker's order, but it's not altogether that different. These are executive orders issued by the government, which just as I say, essentially mandate shelter in place and then define in some detail what are the exceptions and what are essential, uh, essential travel and essential businesses. Within, uh, within the scope of the, uh, of, the, of the state. All right, to finally get to the topic, what is the legal landscape? I wanna talk a bit about constitutional law. There is not surprisingly a, a clash between on the one hand, the governor's, uh, sorry, the government's, well, it is the governor's, regulation on individual liberty and business conduct on the one hand, and on the other, various constitutional rights and civil liberties, which are arguably implicated by these various restrictions. And here is an incomplete list, but a list that uh, uh, of constitutional liberties that have been most conspicuously advocated on behalf of individuals and have generated lawsuits. Every one of these examples uh, uh, are currently in the uh, in the courts to a greater or lesser degree. There is a, an invocation of the constitutional right to travel, which, although nowhere mentioned specifically in the Constitution, has been seen as a key component part of our individual unenumerated rights or individual liberties under the federal con uh, constitution. And when I say freedom of travel, I don't mean just in the narrow sense of traveling, say, from Illinois to Indiana, although freedom of travel is implicated by those restrictions, but I'm talking about just the, 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 the freedom of mobility to be able to travel outside your house and, and to go uh, around uh, uh, with your life. The freedom of assembly uh, or freedom of association which is, uh, which is uh, 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 not a sacrosanct right, I suppose they're all sacrosanct in a sense, but a well-established constitutional right 
is certainly implicated, particularly by restrictions that limit the amount of folks who can congregate in whatever setting, be it in a park, in a, in a, in a house of worship, in a, in a social setting, at a party, what have you. There are religious liberty issues that I want to dwell on for a couple of minutes in a moment that are implicated uh, particularly by restrictions that, let me be precise, don't exempt houses of worship for the restrictions on, on congregation. So I'm not here talking about uh, uh, specific regulations that say you may not go to church because that's not typically how they operate. These are restrictions that say you may not congregate with more than 10 or 25 people and that don't exempt religious worship from those, uh, from those restrictions. They, uh, they arguably implicate the free exercise clause, which is part of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. There's the right to privacy. I'm not going to talk about it a lot in this presentation. It's, a fair, it's sort of a rabbit hole, but these are issues involving surveillance and restrictions that, that may uh, well be to come as we move toward a more uh, broad scale contract trace, uh, contact tracing regime. Again, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit in the Q&A, but you can imagine the arguments. And enumerated powers doctrine is sort of a phrase that only lawyers or legal scholars will love. Here's what it means in a nutshell. It means that the federal government uh, uh, lacks uh, those constitutional powers except insofar as they are enumerated in the Constitution itself. So one species of that argument is that the federal government doesn't have these vast range of powers to restrict individual and business behavior unless you can locate them somewhere in the Constitution. What's really interesting, and to segue to the second bullet point, and much more important, is not the role of the federal government and the powers of the federal government, but the powers of the state government. Obviously, that's more interesting because that's where the action is. These are state uh, 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 sheltering in place restrictions. These are exercises of power by the government. And to make a long story short, state governments have long had something called the police power, which is in essence the constitutional power to protect health, safety, and welfare. It's an extraordinarily broad power. It's a power that, whose history and roots go back to the beginning of the Republic. So when we talk about constitutional power, the state police power to help protect health, safety, and welfare, which is obviously at the fulcrum of these public health strategies, is uh, an exceptionally broad power. It is not unlimited, and it is limited, of course, by constitutional uh, rights and civil liberties that exist either under the federal constitution, which you're probably more familiar with, or that exists under the state constitution. I'll just say again, in the interest of time, just a, just a half a sentence about the interstate separation of powers. This is the issue that's implicated by the fact that the governors are exercising all these powers. And the question arises, what business is it, is it of Governor Pritzker and Governor Newsom and Governor Cuomo to exercise these powers? Doesn't the governor have to go through the checks and balances that exist by virtue of the state separation of powers and the state legislature? Anyway, that was more than a half a sentence, but you see the issue as it, as it, as it arises. There is one case that overhangs or underlays this co these constitutional disputes more than any other. And unfortunately, it's a case that's 115 years old, and that's Jacobson versus Massachusetts. It's not an accident that this case is decided at the turn of the 20th century. It's decided under the, uh, under the, uh, in, in the hothouse of the smallpox epidemic. And the Supreme Court in Jacobson considers the question of whether and to what extent the Constitution, the federal Constitution, constitutional rights limits, and in what ways does it limit the exercise of uh, authority, uh, state police power to regulate health, safety, and welfare. And it's uh, the holding in Jacobson is a very strong statement of the broad scope of state power and simultaneously the limits on the exercise of constitutional rights in public health emergencies. So these are a few phrases. I could quote 16 or 17 others that give you a sense of the spirit of that case. May it, civil liberties may at times be restricted as the safety of the general public may demand. And it is no part of the function of the court to decide which measures are likely to be the most effective for the protection of public health and disease. So this is really Jacobson in a nutshell. Number one is understanding that civil liberties are restricted in times of emergency and simultaneously understanding that the role of the courts are very limited. 
there are 20 or 25 other cases that I'll skip over that not Supreme Court cases, I hasten to add, not Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court cases, but lower court cases in the courts of appeal and the district courts and the state courts that really embar embellish and elaborate on the, uh, on the, on the Jacobson uh, framework. So let me get to some easy cases and hard cases. Here are, this is in the eye of the beholder, but in my opinion, some fairly easy cases, uh, many of which are currently being, being litigated in the courts as we speak. The rights to assembly cases have turned out in the last three weeks and are likely to turn out in the coming weeks in favor of state authority. To put it another way, individuals are likely to lose when they invoke the right to assembly as a case against the sheltering in place orders. The key point here, the key point here is state authority has to be content neutral. It is not acceptable to say, for example, you cannot congregate in, uh, in order to exercise political protests. So the folks who are you know, on the, uh, in the public parks or, or the, uh, the folks uh, in, in Austin, Texas saying, you know, open things up. You can't restrict, restrict their ability to congregate but allow individuals to basically go into the beaches and bring their kids and their dogs and, and, uh, and have fun. It has to be content neutral. Also, there have to be alter, alternative means of congregating. One of the interesting facts of modern technology, like the sorts of technology that's enabling us to speak now is, there is more of an opportunity for folks to have virtual satyrs to uh, communicate with one another. And so that uh, reinforces the government's power to regulate the right to assemble. The travel cases have not been, the reason it's blank there is there haven't been any uh, uh, court uh, conclusions on that, but by and large, I think those are losers for individuals who claim that their ability to, to I mean, uh, to, to just be out in the world uh, uh, are of constitutional moments. There's one case in Pennsylvania that rejects the argument that this is essentially the exercise of the eminent domain authority. And so even though the government has the power to restrict private businesses, they should pay them just compensation. That has been a loser, probably would be a loser. And the due process clause, which is basically, well, you should find out whether individuals are sick before you restrict them, are unlikely to, uh, unlikely to persist. Separation of powers cases, some of them get, uh, get a lot of headlines like the Wisconsin voting dispute cases, case that was decided a couple of years ago when the governor attempted to restrict the timing of the April 7th primary and lost. That's a separation of those uh, separation of powers cases that are unlikely to uh, go uh, anywhere. Essential business disputes are kind of goofy and interesting. Maybe we could talk more about them in the Q and A. Q &A. Uh, some gun rights advocates have argued their Second Amendment rights are limited because firearm uh, sales have not been regarded as essential businesses. Those have by and large they by and large lost those cases. Big surprise. The marijuana cases. There's a case uh, currently before in the Massachusetts courts in which the Massachusetts uh, lower trial court judge said it's okay for the governor to say we can close down recreational marijuana businesses even in a state in which it's legal but still allow liquor stores and medical marijuana religious liberty are somewhat harder cases those arguments have have gone through the courts there's one uh big uh, court uh case the new mexico case that has uh, upheld government restrictions on uh on religious worship okay and there's another case out of kansas that cuts the other way and the Kansas case, I'll just focus on for a moment by saying, in the Kansas case, what the court said was, look, uh, it's true that these are content neutral and that the government is seeking to restrict uh, congregations uh, uh, for whatever purposes, in parks, in bars, in restaurants, and in churches. But the governor is going over uh, uh, above and beyond to basically say, don't go to Easter services, don't go to Passover services. And it's, it seems, to, so the Kansas court said, it seems that they are particularly worried about religious congregants. And moreover, religious worship is of a special status under the Constitution and under the various state religious freedom restoration acts. So as long as the churches are exceptionally careful in terms of sanitation, in terms of control and all of that, it's not for the government to restrict religious worship. And so there's, again, at least one case in which under the scope of religious liberty, the court has said that, uh, that, these, uh, that, uh, that churches can, can operate. And again, these are just some quotes from the cases. There are some hard cases, and I know I'm winding down on time. The question of discriminatory treatment. So if, for example, to take these protests, the government starts doing what the op-eds are calling for and CNN and others uh, is 
shut down these protests, find these folks who are, who are gathering together to protest these sheltering in place. The government has to be pretty careful about doing that. They have to make sure that they are not uh, attempting to restrict the ability of individuals to protest. They have to make sure, and here's a, here's a, a, a thought experiment, they have to explain why it's okay to issue fines for individuals who are cheek by jowl with one another engaging in political protests, but it's not okay to basically say all of us who go into Safeway and are having our shopping carts right next to somebody else's shopping cart are not being fined. So they have to be very careful that they're not engaging in arbitrary or discriminatory treatment. It could, cases could start being hard when the duration of these shelter in place orders continue. So in other words, a case might have been easy for a three week shelter in place restriction. But if it turns out to be a three month shelter in restriction, then this might uh, tip the balance for too much of an imposition on the ability of individuals right to travel, right to assemble. So that's the Hobson's choice for uh, state governments, how long to keep these shelter in place requirements, uh, requirements in place. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip that, but there's an interesting case that involves therapeutic abortions that I'm happy to talk about out of Texas and, uh, uh, and some, other, some other issues. The White House role, again, I want to mostly uh, skip. These are, these, although they get a lot of oxygen and ink and attention from reporters, the legal issues are not even all that interesting. Does the president have absolute authority? Hell no, he doesn't have absolute authority. Does he have the ability to restrict the, the shelters in place? No, he doesn't where the president and the federal government can be of most use is aid and comfort and help and the use of the Defense of Production Act and, and the like. I will uh, uh, bring this to a conclusion by mentioning two areas of law that I haven't focused on but are really important and bring a, a little uh, uh, an issue a little closer to home. Employment law, let's be candid about this. There are not many uh, protections of employees in the case of furloughs and layoffs and all of this. Yes, there are some ability for individuals to get recompense for under the Family Medical Leave Act, but hey, that's 80 hours. And once that's exhausted, the longer the shelter in place orders continue, the less redress employees have vis-a-vis -vis employers for, uh, for termination. The more interesting employment law issues will arise after things go back to normal. And the question really is individuals who say, hey, it's too dangerous for me to come to work. So a 65-year-old uh, immunocompromised member of the Northwestern faculty says, uh, President Shapiro, I respect that you've opened uh, Northwestern for in-person uh, in residential uh, classes beginning in the fall, but I'm not coming into work. I feel unsafe. Then what happens? And those issues of employment law, you've already seen that in connection with nurses and doctors are going to raise some very interesting very interesting uh, uh, issues. I say a bit closer to home, not only with that example, but you probably saw the news of the University of Arizona pay cuts two days ago. That's coming. They just lopped off 20% of the, 15% uh, for certain employees and 20% of, uh, of compensation for everyone, including tenured faculty. And, uh, and, and seldom, uh, uh, and few folks believe that there are any employment law protections. Contracts force majeure is going to be an a, 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 a enormous cluster of cases that are going to come uh, down the pike uh, involving uh, exceptions from contract law. And again, we can talk about this in, in Q&A or business interruption insurance uh, for individuals. I'll, I'll just mention in passing the SARS experience from about 17 years ago suggests that if you don't have language in your contracts that protect you against an act of God and that's specific to viruses like this, you're probably out of luck. You're not going to get the, the courts to just step in and say you're protected no matter, no matter what. I'll, uh, there's some issues involving criminal justice, but I'm sensitive about the timing and, and all of that. So I'm actually going to stop. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm happy to talk about the issues in connection with criminal justice or other issues that, as they, uh, as they uh, might arise. So I, I, I feared that I would go on a long time because there are so many legal issues. But uh, trust me when I say I didn't even really uh, scratch the surface.